Yeah, the clues are coming in. And this one right here, stars falling from heaven, that is the key clue. If you know what that is, you're going to know so many other things about church age prophecy. Won't help you in the final phase, that final phase that we won't be here for. It really doesn't speak to that, but it certainly speaks to our time, and it's a brilliant clue that you have to know. Many of you already do, but this this has to be cemented. In the, in the next video, I recently discovered another clue that I didn't know was there. Some of you have seen it. Some of you haven't seen it, like me, because it depends on your translation. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been looking into that situation so that I could honestly, conclusively say one way or another what I thought was true. Does it belong in the Bible or does it not belong in the Bible? We want to talk about that clue next time. But this time, this clue, stars falling from heaven, takes center stage for us. Before I start, I probably don't need to say this, but I'm going to. If you don't know what that is, or if you get it wrong, does that mean you're going to miss the rapture? Is that what I'm saying? I would never say that. And I've never said that. I've been careful to be very cautious about even intimating anything like that. I think the benchmark for rapture are for those who are eagerly awaiting his appearance. There are people all over the world who don't have access to teachers and a, and a really sound understanding about prophecy, but they absolutely are eagerly awaiting his appearance. That's what he wants. What's important about prophecy is it fuels that desire. It fuels and continues and gives us strength to continue to want to eagerly await him as it continues to give us clues and insight. I've, I've said this before. I've used this analogy before. You walk into your house. Your two youngest children are at the window just, just looking, and they're excited. What are, you, what are you guys doing? We're waiting for Grandma and Grandpa. Well, they may not be coming until after bedtime, but they might be. But they might be before, right? Can we eat, Can we eat dinner here in front of the window? And then you go back into the house, and there's your slacker teenage son laying on the couch with his device. Hey, bud, your, your grandma and grandpa are coming later. I know. How long are they going to stay? That's what most of the church looks like. People who are engaged in prophecy are at that window. We're eagerly awaiting. And many people who don't even understand prophecy are at that window. That's what he wants. He wants us running out under the front yard when he pulls up, so to speak. That's what he's looking for. That's what the parable about the ten virgins was all about. So even though it, what I'm saying today is not mandatory, it's important because it will excite you to know what's going on and how near he is. Would it surprise you that the very first explanation given in the book of Revelation, it sometimes will explain the, the symbols and the symbology given. The first explanation in the book of Revelation deals with just this. Let's take a look at it. It's in the very first chapter. John has done his greeting. He's explained that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he sees the Lord walking amongst the lampstands with seven stars in his right hand. And the Lord speaks to him and says, Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Right off the bat, the first thing he's connecting that he wants us to see, stars and angels are going to be connected in this book. And he's connecting them right before he gives his letters to the churches. This one is so important because it has a ripple-down effect. It will show you so many things about what, what is about to take place. Because once you see that stars and angels are being connected, when you see in the 12th chapter that Satan draws a third of the stars to him, 
you know, it's angels. He has collected a third of the angels to his side. And then the very next thing is war in heaven, and Satan and his angels are cast to earth. At the sixth seal, you, you see the stars falling from heaven. That, again, is the outcome of war in heaven. We know it's going to be angels falling to earth. And the, the winter fig analogy, it's like the winter figs being cast off by a fig tree when a gust of wind hits it. The winter figs are bad. They never ripen. They're worthless. And that's what this is indicating to us. And then you go to the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus is talking about stars falling to earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The powers, that's the authorities. It's war in heaven. He's connecting that to his appearance. But we know because of what we read in the 12th chapter that it's not the end. Satan continues on his conquest, earthbound, with just a short time left. But he brings forth the beast. He brings forth the false prophet, 666, the beast system, and eventually he goes to Armageddon where he's defeated. So war in heaven is by no means in that final phase. So much of the church wants to tell you that the Olivet Discourse is in the final phase. That's the end thing of the final phase when it's not. So they have to deny that stars falling from heaven are angels. Otherwise, they get trapped into seeing that the Olivet Discourse is not an event that takes place in the final phase. It's an event that takes place in the church age. And when Jesus says, I will send my angels out at that time to gather the elect, it's the church. And since it's connected to the sixth seal, they don't like that. They want the rapture before any of the seals are open. So they have to deny that stars falling from heaven are angels. And it starts right here with this right, very, very passage in the first chapter of Revelation. What do they tell you about this? This is what you've heard, that, well, angels can mean messengers, okay? And so really what Jesus is saying is write to the leaders of the church. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. I looked at every single use of angel or angels in the New Testament. Every single time, it appears to be talking about a supernatural being, not a human. But here they want you to see it's a human agency. It's a human being, maybe the uh, bishop of the church or the elder of the church that he's writing to. And then from then on, though, throughout the book of Revelation, it goes back to supernatural beings because they don't want you to see the tie-in of angels and stars. They start their propaganda early. So let me ask him something. If he were to write to the elders of the church, the leaders of these seven churches, how is that letter going to get delivered since he's in exile on Patmos? Was, was he expecting the Romans to come by every few months and go, John, do you have any mail, outgoing mail? Of course not. He had no way to get these letters to the churches. But messengers from God sure could, couldn't they? They could take the message he is writing down to the churches. And does it surprise you that the churches have angels involved with their affairs, watching, being a witness? Who knows what else they're doing for the church and, and around the institutions all over the world? Does that surprise you? Of course it doesn't. No, this is just a way of them to get you to stop. Don't look at this. Don't see the connection between stars and angels. And it gets worse. I'm going to show you the, the lengths they, they will go to to keep us from seeing this connection because this connection destroys their timeline. I'm going to use John MacArthur's study Bible. Okay, I've made the notes in here. I actually have the study Bible's in the back of the house somewhere, and I made the notes. I want to read because he represents classic pre trib belief that we are raptured before the seals are open and that the Olivet Discourse belongs in the very last part of the last seven years. To do that, he has got to obfuscate the idea 
that angels and stars are being connected in the book of Revelation. Let me show you how he does it. And he's not the only one. I'm just using him as a broad example. They all do it. Every last single one of them out of the Dallas Theological Seminary. John MacArthur is not out of that seminary, but he has a very similar belief. It's a typical evangelical pre-trib belief. Avoid the connection between stars and angels. Let's go to the sixth seal. Let me show you what he says about the stars falling from heaven at the sixth seal and then the follow-up metaphor or simile about the fig tree casting its winter figs to the ground. First, the stars falling from heaven. Here's what John MacArthur says. The word stars can refer to any celestial body, large or small, and is not limited to normal English usage. The best explanation is a massive asteroid or meteor shower. A meteor shower. He has just taken one of the most significant events of all time and distilled it down to a meteor shower. These are angels being cast to the earth because the powers of the heavens have been shaken. And he wants us to believe it's a meteor shower. So what is he going to do about the fig tree? When they're angels being cast to earth, the fig tree analogy makes perfect sense. They're the rotten figs. Each year, fig trees produce a rotten winter harvest because they never ripen. They just fall to the ground. And that's the analogy that the Holy Spirit wants us to see. This is heaven getting rid of their worthless crop who never ripened into what they should have been. So what's he going to do since meteors and asteroids are not inherently evil or good? How will he handle the fig tree metaphor? Let's see. Winter figs that grow without the protection of leaves are easily blown from the tree. What? How in the world does that make any sense? How in the how in the um, how in the world is that relevant to a meteor shower? What? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And he probably knows it. He's a high IQ guy. I don't care whether you like him, don't like him. Love him, don't love him. I don't care. He has a high IQ. He's, a, he's the closest thing a pastor gets to being a scholar. He knows that this could easily be angels being cast to earth, and they're the bad ones. He knows that. But he knows if he goes with that, he has to redo the timeline. He has to pick up the phone and call his publisher and say, stop the presses, pull those books, pull the tapes, the CDs, the, the, the digital downloads that I've done on prophecy because it was wrong. I was wrong. So he sticks with this. It's insane, and it's inane, and it's asinine. He, this is the length they will go to to stop us from seeing the connection between angels and stars. Again, why didn't the Holy Spirit just say angels are stars? He essentially did in the first chapter, by the way. But prophecy isn't free. He's not going to give it to the slacker in the back room on his device waiting for grandma and grandpa. He's going to give it to the people who are looking. You have to put a little work ethic and a little sweat effort into it to get the truth. That's just the way prophecy is. Now, let me show you how he handles the Olivet Discourse because Jesus... In the Olivet Discourse, on two occasions, talks about stars falling to earth. And it's always connected to, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Let's take a look at what John MacArthur's notes are on that. Stars falling to earth from heaven. Heavenly bodies will careen at random through space. That's his note. That's his entire note. They'll just, there's just, it's just going to be a mess up there. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says the stars will fall to earth. Stars will fall from heaven. It's just a big old random nonsense thing going on in the atmosphere. No, it's the angels incoming. That's why men are fainting with fear and forebodings as they see what is coming on the earth. It's angels, and it's the most frightening thing they've ever seen in their lives. What does he say about the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Here's his note on that. Powers of the heavens. All the forces of energy that hold everything in space constant and which Christ controls, he will allow to become random and chaotic. So it's just a you know, big atmospheric mess. Again, one of the all-time, all-time greatest historical 
events in all of history, war in heaven, is being displayed as, eh, it's just, you know, meteor shower and a bunch of things careening around in space. And it's the end. See, he wants you to think it's the end. It's all falling apart. It's the end. So I wondered, well, what is he going to do in Revelation 12 when it talks about the red dragon, Satan, sweeping a third of the stars to him? You can't call that a meteor shower. You can't call it an asteroid shower. He, he's kind of locked in. Will he admit that at least there, stars and angels are being connected? Satan sweeping a third of the stars. His note is, Satan's original rebellion resulted in one third of the angelic host joining his insurrection and becoming demons. He finally had to admit it. There was no more wiggle room. He couldn't come up with anything that even looked normal. I don't know about that last part, into becoming demons. I'm not sure about that. But at least he finally is admitting that stars and angels are being connected there. But any other time that he was given an out, he took the out. They hide this from us. They're, they, they're becoming so much like the mainstream media. Just making sure their agenda gets taught and that you don't see what's really going on. Because they're more concerned about their timelines and getting that right. And anything that gets in the way will be ignored or discussed in a way that's just asinine. This, this is asinine. He is capable of so much better thought than this. It's ridiculous. And that's why so much of the church is not ready. That's why I asked you to pray. And thank you for so many of you who responded positively to that. I'm going to put a prayer. I'm going to pin a prayer that a, a viewer made. Uh, Beth made this prayer, and I, I'm going to pin it to the comment section. It's a really good prayer. She's good with prayers. That's, that's for sure. And, uh, I, and I want us to continue doing this. But we're coming upon, we're either in the seventh year of the Revelation 12 sign, or we're about to enter it in two months. If I was going to be fully transparent and honest, if I had to choose between those two, my life depended on it, I would say we're entering the seventh year in two months. On September 23rd of this year, we will enter the seventh year year of that sign. I think that's the most important year since its sign was given. And I appreciate the viewer who called that to our attention. And I think it's entering the seventh year because he wants to give us the most time that he can. And a sign that comes out of the book of Revelation, where so many sevens are prevalent, it doesn't, and it wouldn't surprise me, that the big event is going to happen in the seventh year of that sign. And we have this kind of nonsense going on in the church. This is why when you go to church, you don't hear stuff about the sea and the waves roaring because they're not interested in the signs that Christ gave at the Olivet Discourse. They've pushed it off, and this is how they do it. Those of you who are like me who are at the front window going, oh, we just want to know when he's coming. We just want to know when he's coming. Just give us the truth. Give us the truth are beginning to see it, and it's fascinating. And we recognize, as good as churches are, as good as these fine men are in teaching us little life lessons and all of that, they fail miserably at eschatology, and so we're going to have to gin it up ourselves. If a rube like me can see that it's angels falling to earth, John MacArthur and the rest of the pastors out of the Dallas Theological Seminary or wherever they're from, they certainly know that's a possibility, but they pass on it every single time because they're protecting their timeline. That's not a good idea. That is not a good idea. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I ran across another sign. I didn't know it was there. Many of you are going to say, no, I knew that was there, but you may not know the relevancy of it. But first, we have to get across the obstacle that it creates. And it's taken me a couple of weeks to be ready to give that for you, the information. Do I believe that this new sign belongs in our Bible, or should it not be in our Bible? I believe it should be in our Bible. And I will make my case on that. And I'm telling, even though it is not as far-reaching as the clue, stars falling from heaven is, oh, it's a fascinating clue. It's like 
we're looking at a microscope, okay? It's something, and God just increased the power of the microscope so we could see something a little closer. It's an amazing clue, and we'll have that for you next time. We're coming upon the seventh year of the Revelation 12 sign. That has an ominous tone to me. We need to get this right. We need to get it right. God bless each and every one of you.